Hello and welcome to GameSack. Today we are pitting the 16-bit Sega Genesis against the 16-bit Super Nintendo. That's correct, and I don't even know why I'm here, Joe, because we all know how this is going to end. The Super Nintendo's way better, obviously, so... Right? No. Am I, okay. no. All right, well, so. there's only one way to do this. We're going to start out with the console comparison, and Joe's really good at that, so do it, Joe. Let's do it. The Sega Genesis versus the Super Nintendo Entertainment System Hardware Power! The Sega Genesis, a.k.a. Mega Drive, and the Super Nintendo, a.k.a. Super Famicom, are both 16-bit consoles. Powering the Super Nintendo is a Ricoh spin-off of the Western Design Center 65C816 running at 3.58 MHz, the same exact speed as the Sega Master System CPU. The Genesis CPU is a Motorola 68000 running at over twice the speed at 7.67 MHz. But the comparisons don't end there. Both consoles have a word length of 16 bits, but the Super NES has a 16-bit internal data bus and an 8-bit external bus. The Genesis, on the other hand, has a 32-bit internal data bus and a 16-bit external one. Both consoles have secondary CPUs to help out with the sound. The Genesis has a Z80 running at 3.58 MHz, the same exact speed of the SNES main CPU, while the Super Nintendo has a Sony SPC700 running at 1.024 MHz. The Genesis has 64 kilobytes of work RAM, whereas the SNES has 128 kilobytes. Of course, the CPUs are only part of the whole picture. For graphics, the Genesis has a palette of 512 colors, whereas the Super Nintendo has 32,768. In most parts of the world, that's a bigger number. The Genesis can do 61 colors on screen at once, whereas the Super NES clocks in at 256 colors. However, if you engage the shadow and highlight modes on the Genesis, you can have up to 1,536 colors with about 192 of them on screen. Those are still much smaller numbers though. The Super Nintendo can also do a transparency layer. For resolution, the Genesis usually comes in at 320 pixels wide by 224 pixels tall. It also has another mode that's 256 pixels wide. By contrast, almost every Super Nintendo game runs at a resolution of only 256 pixels wide by 224 pixels tall. This makes games that appear on both consoles often look fatter and cropped on the SNES as a result. The system also has a 512 pixel wide resolution, but this was rarely ever used. The Genesis can put up to 80 sprites 16 by 16 pixels in size on the screen. Wow! The Super Nintendo can do 128 sprites, but only 8 by 8 pixels in size. Both consoles do have different and bigger sprite sizes, but with fewer on screen at once. The Genesis has, get this, two background layers for nifty parallax scrolling, while the Super NES can have up to four depending on the graphic mode used. I can't even count that high! Speaking of modes, the Super Nintendo has the famous Mode 7 which allows it to scale and rotate a background layer which was a popular feature for developers to use. It could not, however, scale sprites without a helper chip like the Super FX. The Super Nintendo often employed the use of such chips when needed, adding to the cost of the cartridge, whereas only one Genesis game ever did the same, Virtua Racing. Any and all scaling and rotation that the Genesis did had to be done in software, which is of course much slower. As far as audio is concerned, the Genesis has 10 sound channels, whereas the Super Nintendo only has 8. The Genesis has 6 FM sound channels based on the Yamaha 2612. One of those channels can also play back PCM samples. The other four channels are the PSG channels used on the Sega Master System, but they're often used in Genesis games as well. All 8 channels on the Super Nintendo are sample-based and are run through a DSP chip for added effects like reverb. Both consoles offer the latest bleeding-edge multi-channel sound technology called stereo. Both consoles are fantastic, but we need to keep in mind that the Super Nintendo is over two years newer. The fact that the Genesis is even able to compete with it says a lot. Winner! Super Nintendo! Just like I thought, Joe, Nintendo is up 1-0 to zero at the moment, but uh, I noticed you didn't even talk about how they look. Oh, you want to talk about how they look, huh? Okay, let's talk about their aesthetics. The Sega Genesis versus the Super Nintendo Entertainment System overall looks! This is what the Genesis and the Super Nintendo look like. Winner! Sega Genesis! Joe, you didn't even talk about the Super Famicom, and we all know that's a much better looking system. Okay, we all know that consoles are judged on their game libraries, so we figure we've got to talk about their game libraries right now, and, well, 
I'll let you start. Go. The Sega Genesis versus the Super Nintendo Entertainment System! The games! Ah, Super Mario World, the flagship title for the Super Nintendo. What can be said that hasn't been said already about this masterpiece? It's got tons of levels to search, and you'll want to uncover every little secret that this title has to offer. There is a time limit, but you don't have to be in a hurry like that blue bastard on the Genesis. His only mission is to get to the goal as fast as he can. Where's the fun in that? I swear Sonic is the year 2020 of video games. Mario World is the launch title that made the system the huge seller that it was. Super Mario All-Stars was a great surprise. A remake of the three NES titles and that Japanese one that nobody really cared about. I've played Super Mario 1, 2, and 3 on the NES a lot. I was floored by all the detail that was put into this release, especially with the background graphics. So needless to say, I played this title a lot as well, even though it's something that wasn't really new. It's still a classic game and I'll most likely be buried with it. Did Sega remake any Master System games? Probably not because no one cares. Hey, they remade OutRun, idiot! And I'm pretty sure that Great Ice Hockey was remade as Mario Lemieux Hockey, so yeah, they did get a Mario remake. Piss off! Well, that's something I didn't know, Joe. Yoshi's Island Super Mario World 2 took a different turn, most likely to keep the already awesome gameplay from going stale. This time you control Yoshi with a baby Mario on your back. The platforming is intense at times since you're tasked to keep the cutest baby ever on Yoshi's back. If he falls off, you'll know immediately because you'll start crying like a Sega fanboy until you get him on your back again. I absolutely love this game. The crayon-like graphics and the original music is perfect. Well, of course the Genesis has Sonic the Hedgehog, who is the fastest video game character in the fastest game ever made. Look at him go! The gameplay here makes you feel alive because you have to think and react faster than most humans up to this point in our evolution have had to. Wait, no, 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 don't show this level. That's not fair, this doesn't count. Jeez, why is he so slow? Okay, I guess that means that Sonic covers the entire spectrum of having the fastest and the slowest game all in one cartridge. But Sega's blast processing doesn't end there. The Genesis was also so powerful that it had Sonic 2, which had Tails in it. That's right, Tails, everyone's favorite little brother character. Somehow he's able to move just as fast as Sonic, but it's probably because he's on the Genesis. Then we got Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Mario All-Stars may have four or five games on a single cartridge, but that's because he's weak and he doesn't require much room. Sonic is so amazing that he needs two cartridges plugged in at the same time. Holy crap, can you believe this? You can't even plug in two Blu-ray discs at the same time on the PlayStation 5. Only the Sega Genesis is the real deal. Sonic catapulted the Genesis ahead of the Super Nintendo in sales by being included with the system, and it also made Genesis owners feel cool. Buying a Genesis is like buying a sports car. It boosts your self-confidence and makes you a hit with the ladies. Sure, yeah, it also makes you a bit of an ass, but hey, that's a side effect I can deal with. I think you've always been an ass. But let's not stop with Sonic. The Genesis got many awesome arcade ports as well. Games like Capcom Strider. This was a rather innovative platformer in the arcades, and the Genesis is the only console of the time to bring it home intact. I love jumping and slashing around the varied levels. And now I can save 25 cents each time I play it. Sure, I paid $70 for the game, but let's not think about that. The important thing is that I'm saving quarters. The Super Nintendo has Run Saber. It's been called a Strider clone, but is it really? In fact, it does so much more than that average arcade port on the Genesis. Strider has a basic move skill set that works, but that's about it. In Run Saber, you can choose from a female or male character. That's just the beginning of the fun, and man, is that part fun! Each level is packed with baddies for you to destroy. You do this with your standard slash like Strider, but you have more moves. If that's not enough, you also have a special move that's like a magic attack. Variety Overload! They even threw in some outstanding Mode 7 effects. Where's your Mode 7, Strider? I thought so. The Genesis even got a port of Ghouls and Ghosts. For its time, it was an incredibly accurate port. Sure, a few of the background graphics are different here and there compared to the arcade, but it plays incredibly well. This is a game that I still play often to this day, making my way through it twice. It's so much fun that you actually don't mind doing that. Ghouls and Ghosts is still the best game in the entire franchise, and I will die on that hill. Well, Super Ghouls and Ghosts is the evolution of the Ghosts and Goblins series. Unlike Ghouls and Ghosts, this game isn't a port of an arcade game. 
A few features that make this game rise above are the new double jump that adds more depth to the platforming instead of the normal run and shoot gameplay in previous titles. There's a really good use of Mode 7 rotation incorporated in a few of the levels which improves the game by a factor of, well, seven. Top it off with a soundtrack that's an instant classic and all of a sudden you have the pinnacle of the series. Turtles in Time is a faithful port of the arcade game. While most of the game is intact, it's missing a few things like voice samples, for example, and some animations. But nobody misses those. The game is better off without all that stuff. But on the plus side, a cool techno drum level was added. This had a really cool boss fight with a view behind Shredder where you had to throw your enemies at him. So cool. Why am I telling you this? Everyone has played this game and has loved it. The Genesis got a turtle game, Hyperzone Heist, but it feels watered down in comparison. It feels like a chore to play that game, whereas playing Turtles in Time is like getting a back rub from Princess Peach. Super Metroid is one of those games that just clicks with you instantly. The game's exploration mechanic is actually fun. There's only a few games out there like this that I actually don't mind going back and forth visiting areas multiple times, and this might be the king. Sorry, Symphony of the Night. Everything about this game gives me the feels. The graphics, gameplay, and haunting music will immerse you into each area, making you want to keep playing. Well, it does to me anyways. I'm trying to think if there's a game on the Genesis like this, and I don't think there is except for, well, maybe Echo the Dauphin, but <laughs> we all know what a snorefest that game is. Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2 by Rare are a pair of super fun platforming games. But Dave, there were three Donkey Kong Country titles. I know that, but the third one feels like a top-tier Genesis game. It's just not fun at all. The first two entries, though, are dear to me, and lots of memories flood my brain every time I play them. Controlling two characters, not at the same time, added some depth to the gameplay. Donkey, Diddy in the first game, and Dixie and Diddy in the second game all had attributes that were helpful in certain areas throughout each level. Rare is known for making games that were search fests, and these were no exception. What was Sega's response to Donkey Kong Country? Vector Man! Oh my god, what a huge fail, but not a surprising one. Contra 3 is all about the Alien Wars. Nothing better than running and gunning huge levels laying waste to every alien you see. I'd hate to be the city janitor having to clean up all those carcasses. <laughs> Besides the traditional side-scrolling levels, the game also has some intense overhead levels that make great use of the system's mind-blowing Mode 7 capabilities. These levels are super fun and are a nice addition, unlike the Genesis Contra game that only has side-scrolling levels. Contra 3 is plainly just a better game. Nintendo rules! Whoa, you are definitely wrong on that. Contra Hardcore on the Genesis offers way more levels, way more challenge, and several unique characters to choose from. Not only that, but it offers branching paths and crazy speed that can only be accomplished with the amazing Motorola 68000 CPU inside of the Genesis. Anyone can beat Contra 3 on normal, but nobody can beat Contra Hardcore on easy. That's because there's no easy option since pansies like yourself need not apply. Yeah, so speaking of Konami, Castlevania 4 would have been the best launch title, but it came out almost four months after the system launched. Keeping in line with the traditional Castlevania style, I've beaten this game more than I beat up Joe on the playground after school. That's how I funded all my game purchases. This is exactly what I wanted in a 16-bit sequel. Better graphics, better music, and some amazing Mode 7 thrown in just because Mode 7 is the best revolution in video games. Killer Instinct is one of the Silicon Graphics powerhouse games by Rare. A port of the arcade game, this brought a different take on the fighting genre. A large and varied cast of fighters to choose from. What made this game a little unique was its combo system. Pulling off huge combos was an impressive feat and you knew it because the game's announcer would let you know and that made you feel really good about yourself and your gaming skills. It's a fun fighter that you'd never see the likes of on the Genesis. Okay then, let's talk about fighting games real quick here. Sure, Street Fighter 2 may have had worse voice quality than the Super Nintendo versions, but I honestly feel the music is closer to the arcade. Not only that, but there are many different hacks out there these days that can give you much higher voice quality than the original releases. But the reason I really want to mention Street Fighter 2 is that it's so natural to play with Sega's absolutely outstanding six-button controller. Two rows of three buttons is much better than using the shoulder buttons for some attacks. However, the big selling point on the Genesis has got to be Mortal Kombat. That's right, the Genesis version has blood and gore, just like the arcade. The Super Nintendo version doesn't have that because they felt the need to protect the children, which were the only people who had a Super Nintendo. You and I both know, Dave, that as kids, we don't need to be protected by a silly corporation. The Genesis is just faster and better, except when it's not, but it almost always is, at least some of the time anyway. Excellent. 
All right, Joe, so far so good, but I think we should talk about what the Super Nintendo is really good at, and that's RPGs. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's talk about what the Genesis is really good at, too. Sports games. Um, okay. Okay, let's talk RPGs. Mario RPG was a refreshing game to play for many reasons. Firstly, it was all about the Mushroom Kingdom where Bowser wasn't the bad guy. Secondly, it had a battle system that wasn't a complete snore fest. It was turn-based like other RPGs, but it was actually fun and grinding was a pure delight. It was really interesting seeing the Mushroom Kingdom from a non-side-scrolling point of view. It was super easy to get into, and the story and gameplay kept your interest until the end. Even the soundtrack was memorable. Did Sega have a Sonic RPG? Not on the Genesis, because nobody likes Sonic or the Genesis. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is easily in the top two games in the Zelda series for me. It's one of those games that I've played enough times to know exactly what to do and where to go. I just love the overhead playstyle. Traversing the overworld is easy and fun, with a map to see where you're at, and the majority of the NPCs are fun to talk to. But as we all know, the meat of the game is in the dungeons. Figuring out puzzles and going back and forth to find your way to the boss is never boring. How could it be with the great music the game has to offer? The Genesis has some okay action RPGs, I guess, but nothing the likes of the king, Zelda. Earthbound is one of those games that at first I didn't like. I didn't own the game and I was never really interested. Even when I saw it at Kmart as a blue light special for $39, I was like, no thanks. At the time I wanted dragons and ogres and not some urban kid fantasy. Many years passed and I eventually played it and well, I had a great time. This is a solid RPG that everyone should play. Thanks to the SNES Mini, everyone can play it. I always laugh at how enemies come straight at you on the overworld like, hey you, stop there, I need to kill you. But in the end, they end up dying. Graphics are just blah, but there is some decent music to enjoy and don't forget to call your dad. He worries. You'll find it hard to find anyone who doesn't think that Final Fantasy 3 is the best RPG on the SNES and I would agree with all of them. I've played the game and it has all that you want. Good graphics, good storyline, and good music. In fact, the music, in my opinion, is the best part of the game. Grinding is actually bearable since you want to hear the music over and over again. There's nothing about this game that you don't know already, but if you haven't played this game, then what the fuh? The Genesis has a game called Fantasy Star or some such nonsense. It can't be good if you can't even spell the word fantasy correctly. Stupid Sega. I'd bet money that if you ask people what the second best RPG on the SNES is, they would say Chrono Trigger. Yes, another fantastic RPG from Square that will keep you occupied for many hours. And I mean that since the game has multiple endings and since you're a loser and have no life, you might as well see them all. But don't worry though, you're not as big of a loser as a Sega fan. There's so much to this game to keep you occupied, from side quests to time travel to a really cool battle system, there's not much to hate here. The Genesis may not have been king of the RPGs, but it has some good ones. The Fantasy Star games are outstanding, especially Fantasy Star 4. This is one area where I need to cede to the Super Nintendo, but that in no way means that the RPGs that were on the Genesis were bad or not worth playing. The Fantasy Star games all tell great stories. I really love how Fantasy Star 4 wrapped everything together. Fantasy Star 3 even had branching paths with multiple endings long before Chrono Trigger was even a wet spot on Square's bedsheets. Sword of Vermilion may be a bit clunky, but I still had a ton of fun with it. Though honestly, I'd recommend using a guide or something to help with the maps. The console even had fantastic action RPGs like Crusader of Senti, which is a Zelda ripoff, and a damn good one too. Or the incredible Beyond Oasis from Ancient, the Super Nintendo just didn't have anything like it. Or the isometric Landstalker and Light Crusader. Let's not forget the strategy RPGs like Master of Monsters, Warsong, and of course, the Shining Force series. You really can't go wrong here, and there are a ton of great games in the genre to play. To ignore these would mean you are absolutely missing out. And do you really want to miss out? Moving on, the Super Nintendo has the best sports games. NHL 94 was released for both the SNES and Genesis. It's not surprising that the SNES version is the better version. In the Super Nintendo release, you can play with up to four of your friends. That's right, five players at the same time. 
In the Genesis, you can only have four players. Your fifth friend has to sit and watch you play. Not that you have that many friends if you own a Genesis. So what's the point in playing the Genesis version? Both games play the same, but the Nintendo version has better sound from effects to music. I've spent many times playing this game with four of my friends. Kirby's Dream Course is kind of a sports game. I'm gonna call it Putt-Putt Golf with a twist. The goal of the game is the same as Putt-Putt, and that's to get the ball, Kirby, in the hole in the fewest shots. Each hole is designed to test your problem-solving skills. You'll be scanning the play area over and over, looking for the best way to try and get a hole in one. Kirby can run over power-ups that he can use instantly once he picks it up. You can use this power-up once per shot, and the good thing is that they carry you over to the next hole. This is a unique game that's really fun to play, and you won't find anything like it on the Genesis. Hal's Hole-in-One Golf is a great top-down golf game for the system. I don't know who Hal is, but man, he knows how to make a fun game. I'm just kidding, I know who Hal is, so hold off on that comment. This title gets little to no love like most golf games out there, but I'm here to let it be known that it's a game everyone should play. It's very easy to pick up the mechanics, and before you know it, you'll be shooting under par. Each hole starts out with a flyover in glorious Mode 7. This is truly the future of gaming. Even the music in this game is super catchy. After 18 holes of it, you'll have it in your head for a very long time. Be sure to give this game a little love. Super Punch-Out is the premier boxing title on the SNES. Nintendo didn't need the help of an actual boxer to sell this game. Mike Tyson gave them a good foothold with the NES game. Just the words Punch-Out were sufficient enough for a savvy buyer and it sold plenty well on its own, unlike Buster Douglas boxing on the Genesis. If his name wasn't on that box, it wouldn't have even sold the 180 copies that it did. Super Punch-Out, on the other hand, is a smash hit. You don't control Little Mac in this game, but just some random player. I've always loved Super Punch-Out for its arcade-style fun. Fast action and learning your opponent's little secrets meant lots of playtime. Now we just need a new Punch-Out on the Switch. Who doesn't like a good baseball game? Nintendo has the best with Ken Griffey Jr. presents Major League Baseball. It's baseball, folks. You hit the ball and try and score points on offense, and on defense you try and catch the ball and get your opponent out. The Genesis has Tommy Lard-ass baseball, which yes, is baseball and can be enjoyed just like Ken Griffey Jr. presents Major League Baseball. What it boils down to is who do you want on the cover of your game? A fat old man or a young all-star in his prime who has a much better stat line than the fat guy? He's out. Pitch out. Get the block. <laughs> Don't even get me started on sports. Electronic Arts knew that sports games would be huge. <laughs> Ever heard of John Madden football? Well, I have, and on the Genesis is where it made its name as the premier football video game franchise. Touchdown! And for good reason, as it's incredibly fun to play and easy to get into. It even looks and sounds great. Touchdown! Of course, they updated it every year, and back then they actually made improvements and noticeable differences on a yearly basis. Can you even imagine? EA also made a ton of other sports games on the console, making the Genesis the go-to machine for sports games. It's easy to scoff at sports games, but these games are a huge market and really helped the Genesis to take off as much as it did. Also, did Pat Riley endorse any basketball game on the Super Nintendo? No, they just have Bill Lame Beer, whose net worth is 67 million less than Pat Riley's and is therefore a less successful human being, and thus his game is far worse. You get what you pay for, Nintendo. Did the beautiful Tommy Lasorda endorse any non-Genesis baseball games? That's right, I didn't think so. Pat Riley and Tommy Lasorda both knew that the Genesis is king. I can only imagine the crazy Sega parties that those two would throw with Joe Montana and Arnold Palmer at Michael Jackson's house. They'd all get together and play Mystic Defender, a game that's easy to pull down and play with four mega power. Who's gonna throw Nintendo parties? Ken Griffey, all by himself? We know Bill Lame Beer can't even afford the cab to make it to the party with his paltry $13 million net worth. How sad. Oh, and look at Ken Griffey Baseball's title screen. Now, look at Tommy Lasorda Baseball. Look at this gorgeous man. Only the Genesis has enough raw power to construct his visage on the title screen and still have enough left over for a quality baseball game. Hit by a pitch. The Genesis is better than real sports, I'm just saying. It's, it's pretty heated so far, Joe, and I gotta say, I don't know if it's gonna end the way I thought it was. You know, I kinda think it's not gonna end the way I thought it was either, but whatever, let's just throw everything out there and talk about the rest of the games. Well, not every game, but the ones we truly do wanna mention. Yes, the ones that count.
F-Zero is one of the launch games for the system, and wow, did it make a quick impression. Yeah, the F stands for fun. Fun Zero. Zero fun. There's more than zero fun in this game, Joe, and you know it. It has lightning fast racing on tracks with amazing Mode 7 effects, and it made it feel like you're really racing in the future. Not a lot of vehicles to choose from, but all you really need is Captain Falcon. The graphics were good for the time with lots of different backgrounds. And I always loved when you crashed and the camera turned around to see the smoke coming from the wreckage. You've got to assume that there's no way Falcon could have survived, but sure enough he did survive to race again. I also loved all the little things in here, like wind that would push your vehicle making you compensate all while trying not to crash. The music was really good, and it still is. Nintendo started something great with Mario Kart, another title that used the unbelievable Mode 7 effect that the Genesis only wished it could do. Dude, be quiet. Here's some Mode 7 running on the Genesis and software without any lame helper chips. There is literally nothing that the Genesis can't do except for things that are beyond its ability. Get out of here. This is my segment. Blazing around tracks and battling with friends in pseudo 3D was amazing. Little did I know it at the time, but this title would suck hundreds of hours out of my life. And you know what? I don't regret a single moment of it either. I didn't quit playing it until I had gold trophies on every cup in every difficulty. Who am I kidding? Because I didn't stop after that. Playing battle mode with a friend was always a great time. Learning how to dodge red shells by cutting corners or using the red feather to hop out of the playfield was really fun. The game has evolved into a solid franchise, but I will always love the original for all the joy it brought me. Star Fox is the first game to use the Amazing FX chip. This is the game that Nintendo needed to fill the urge for polygon gaming. 2D sprites were getting old and the SNES just wasn't ready for full-on 3D. So why not use a chip to help that aging system stay alive and still bring you a lot of fun? This game really is fun and has tons of personality. All the characters are likable, even that salty bitch Falco. The levels were long in length and the huge screen-filling bosses were a blast to fight. Sega also developed a chip to help push polygons on the Genesis. I think it was the STD chip or something like that. Lame, Star Fox is way better. Stunt Race FX was the second game to use the fabled FX chip. And if you like racing at a slow pace with low frame rate, this is the game for you. I do like the variety in tracks and even the vehicles are interesting. There's lots of things to unlock and it'll keep you busy for a while. That is, if you don't get bored and move on to another game, which might actually be the case. Still, I applaud Nintendo for the effort and I think a sequel would have been a huge improvement, but we'll never know. Pilot Wings was another surprise launch title that made me all warm inside. At first I was like, what's this crap, Nintendo? Then I apologized and bought it because that's what I do. After playing the game for an hour or so, I felt really bad for lashing out without knowing what it was all about. A flying simulator sounds like work, and that's probably what I was thinking. This isn't work, this is a really fun arcade-style game. Flying a biplane, skydiving, hang gliding, and using a jetpack all became insanely fun. Nintendo really knows how to add little touches to a game to make it really enjoyable. Oh, and the phenomenal Mode 7 kicks all sorts of Sega butt. Actraiser came a few months after the launch of the system. I'd never played a game like this before. Playing as a god, it took a while before I learned the society building aspect of the game. Taking offers from your people was fun and made you feel like a god. The true fun though was when you found the main demon hunt. You took the form of a warrior and went on a side-scrolling adventure to put an end to the evil. I always loved the music in this game and many many years later I realized that it was Yuzo Koshiro that did the soundtrack. It made sense though since he's amazing. I really can't think if the Genesis has any game that's even close to as good as this. It probably doesn't, but I don't know since I don't spend much time thinking about that stupid system. Demon's Crest is the third game in the Gargoyles Quest series. I remember when the game came out. Joe and I were at Electronics Boutique in a dying mall called Cinderella City. They only had one copy and we both wanted it. Somehow I ended up getting the game and Joe got the shaft. Anyways, I played and played this game and was amazed at the graphics. Everything looked creepy and ghoulish just the way it should have. I was less impressed by the music, but it was still better than average. The game was and still is insanely hard. I've always struggled at choosing which gargoyle form was the best. Needless to say, I've never beaten the game. Final Fight 1 through 3 and Guy are a series of beat em ups on the system. It's always a good time playing these games, especially after a hard day at school or at work. 
All you want to do is let off a little steam by smashing some punks face in. Well, you'll get plenty of that here and it's all really fun. Each game has loads of personality as you fight your way through the slums and bars and industrial areas of the city. You can never go wrong with one of these games. Every time I mention playing it with a friend, I never get turned down. Unless it's Final Fight 1 or Guy, but yeah. The only thing about these games that was always annoying was the music. Way too much reverb and just strange composition to begin with. Sega has Streets of Rage, but Nintendo has Final Fight. It's like a hamburger versus a steak. Steak will win every time. King of Dragons, Legend, Magic Sword, and Knights of the Round are just a few of the awesome hack and slash games that are on the system. I love me some medieval fighting with swords and axes. I love killing all sorts of mythical creatures and then fighting a tough boss at the end of the level. These games were a staple in my collection and still are to this day. I never have to decide, do I really feel like playing this game? Because I always do feel like playing these games. There's just a certain charm about collecting tons of dropped items, using magic spells to destroy your enemies, all while listening to some decent to good fantasy music. Sega has a couple of those games with the supposed best one being called Golden Axe. More like a urine colored axe. Those games would only be good on a Nintendo system. <laughs> The Genesis has a ton of other amazing games that I haven't mentioned yet that you just can't get over on the Super Nintendo. Games like Alicia Dragoon where you level up your familiars and zap lightning across the entire screen. This is such a strange and unique game that's still easy to get into. Or any of the Thunder Force games, all of which are absolutely outstanding. They just kept getting better and better. Though Thunder Force 4 was renamed to Lightning Force because Sega of America had a brain aneurysm that day. Hey, it happens. I know I've had my fair share. But do not let that fool you. Get this game and be blown away by absolute 16-bit power goodness. If you like shooters, the Genesis is absolutely the better console, no comparison. I mean, check out Musha here. Overhead shooters don't get much better, and honestly, I'll take this over Space Mega Force any day. The Super Nintendo just can't do shooters very well. You also have the Monster World games, which give you a platformer with an action RPG feel. You don't level up per se, but you do get better items and backtrack. Don't let the weak opening weapons turn you off. These are great games. If you're not a wimp, you can play Splatterhouse 2 and 3 and beat up on scary creatures who ooze real monster blood. If you're a scared little kid who needs his mommy, you may want to stick to the Kirby games provided by Nintendo, which is a company that's staffed by helicopter parents. Hey, I resent that. Of course, Gunstar Heroes from Treasure is one of the premier run and gun games ever made with crazy amounts of energy and special effects. This game is just so much fun, and even years later, I'm learning new techniques. If you're into imports, you can check out Alien Soldier, which was also made by Treasure. This features incredibly challenging boss battle gameplay that you just can't find anywhere on the Super NES. Let's not forget what Konami brought to the table on the system. I already mentioned how awesome Contra Hardcore was earlier, if you can remember that far back in the episode. But how about Castlevania Bloodlines, which is one of the best, if not the best, old school style Castlevanias? Yeah, it's a little weird around the edges, but the fantastic gameplay and the music more than makes up for it. And of course, there's Rocket Knight Adventures, which is an extremely well-designed original platformer. It was brave of Konami to try a new IP, and I'm sure glad that they did because this is a phenomenal game. All of these games are exclusive to the mighty 16-bit Genesis system from Sega. You want ninja action? Don't forget Revenge of Shinobi, which really expanded upon the gameplay of the original. It's tough, but it keeps you coming back again and again. Are you going to let this game get the best of you? Certainly do not underestimate Shadow Dancer. It plays more like the original Shinobi, but it's perhaps even more fun. I like turning the shurikens off and making my way through using only the sword. Can you do that? Don't discount the Golden Axe series either. I'll take these over Knights of the Round or Magic Sword or any of that crap Dave mentioned if I need some medieval beat-em-up action. And I think pretty much anyone else would too. And I bet you thought that I'd forget about the Streets of Rage series, didn't you? 16-bit beat-em-ups absolutely do not get any better than these. Hell, beat-em-ups for any generation don't get any better. Find the lie. Yuzo Koshiro became known to the masses with these games and for good reason as both the games and the music are spectacular. Even the Disney games were a blast with the likes of Quackshot, Castle of Illusion, and World of Illusion. There are just a ton more games that I could list. The Genesis has so many games that it really is hard to keep track of them all. I mean, check the comment section below for the ones I missed. My homie's got my back. Genesis does, bitches.
what, what a, a cop, cop out. out. Actually, I don't think it is a cop out because, you know, we've been fighting this entire episode, you know, having lots of fun. But truthfully, you know, both systems have a stellar library. Yeah, I mean, we're old enough now to know that both systems are just totally awesome. Back in 1994, given we each would have definitely fought hard for our respective systems. But nowadays, they're both just awesome. Yeah, and if you couldn't tell, we've been having a lot of fun jabbing at each other's consoles during this episode. But it's just all in good fun. You really do need to play mm -hmm. both the libraries from both platforms. For sure. Anyway, what do you guys think of the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo? Let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. Dave, it was awesome to have you here on Game Sack again. Oh, that makes me feel great, Joe, because it was really good to be here, man. And anytime you want me to come down, I'm here for you. Oh, definitely. I love making those phone calls. I will call you again very, very soon. I can't wait. Mm, me neither. All right. See you later. See ya. All right. See you, Joe. See you, man. I'll, I'll get the door. Oh. Yeah, right. right.